welcome back to Engineer's Workshop. Today's going to be a pretty quick one. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the flywheel of the Skinner steam engine and flywheels in general and what they do on uh, large reciprocating piston engines such as the steam engine we have here. So if you look at a graph where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is RPM, Let's say we're going to be spinning this flywheel at uh, 300 RPM because that's what we are. So 300 is our speed. If we were to drive the flywheel with an electric motor, and we just spun that thing at an exact constant speed over time, and then at this point in time, we shut the electric motor off, what would happen? Well, at that point, the flywheel would basically coast down to a stop. Would it be linear? I don't know, probably, if the friction were constant over that time. If the friction decreased, you know, this might, this might taper off a little bit. But basically, we're putting energy into the flywheel at this point to keep its speed constant. And then when we stop inputting energy here, let's all agree that the flywheel would come to a stop eventually over some period of time. So what I want to do now, I want to blow up this area right here real big. Zoom in on it. So at 300 RPM, we stop putting energy into this system. And let's all agree that the flywheel from that point begins to slow down. So the speed of the flywheel decreases. Well, what's happening during this time as the engine is running is it's going to be getting power from the um, either the spark ignition, if it's an internal combustion engine, uh, the compression ignition, if it's a diesel engine, or the admission of steam if, it is a, uh, if it's a steam engine. So you got to look at the timing events and the stroke. Let's look at a, uh, let's look at a four cycle engine first. And let's take this point as uh, the end of the combustion stroke. From that point, the flywheel is slowing down. But then at some point here when we have our next compression stroke and we have the, um, either the, the spark igniting the mixture or we have the compression igniting the mixture, we're going to put energy back into the flywheel. And, and the flywheel speed is going to increase back up to our target speed. This occurs over approximately 90 crank degrees. So, 0, 90. And from that point, the flywheel is again slowing down. And being a four cycle motor, it takes four strokes of the piston to complete its, its cycle. So what we have is, this is 200, uh, uh, no, excuse me, 720 crank degrees. So we have basically a sawtooth waveform of the flywheel speed. It has some amplitude from maximum flywheel speed to minimum flywheel speed. Adding energy, I'll put this in red, adding energy over this period. And also here, and taking energy out over this period. Now let's keep the same kind of engine, except let's go to a two cycle. Two cycle has admission of power twice as often as a four cycle. So the two cycle waveform is going to follow this, but at the halfway point, we're going to admit energy. And that flywheel speed is going to come back up. And then it's going to ramp down. Then it's going to come back up. Then it's going to ramp down. 
So we're emitting energy now twice as often. But over the same number of crank degrees. And we're taking energy out for the remainder of that stroke. Well, what did we do? We took that loss from here to here and we basically cut it in half with a, with a two cycle engine. Now, let's look at a steam engine. Most steam engines are double acting. That means they have pressure on the front side of the piston in one stroke and on the back side of the piston in the return stroke. So does that mean that this is a one cycle? I don't know. I've never really heard it called anything. But a steam engine is going to be cut in half again. So a steam engine, we're admitting energy to the flywheel here, 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 and again here. twice as often as a two cycle. And every time we do this, we reduce the amplitude, the variation of uh, maximum RPM of the flywheel to minimum. So a steam engine double acting for a given size flywheel is gonna have the least amount of speed variation of uh, a four cycle, either auto cycle, with a spark ignition or diesel, or a two cycle spark ignition or diesel. The steam engine being a one cycle is gonna have the least variation in speed. So they were used for uh, generating electricity because you could get the smoothest output from, uh, from a steam engine. Now there's one other cause of speed variation in a flywheel that I wanted to go over. For the Skinner engine, you have 11 inch diameter cast iron piston. You got a piston rod. You've got a cross head. And you've got a connecting rod. And that's going to be about 30 pounds. This is going to be about 5, this is going to be about 30, this is going to be about 20. So 60, 70, 80, so you've got 85 pounds of mass that is reciprocating mass. This is not in motion all the time. At the ends of the stroke, all of this is not moving. So we're at one end of the cylinder and we're at the other end of the cylinder. Both cases, 85 pounds of mass is not moving. What happens in the middle? Well, in the middle, at 300 RPM, 12-inch um, stroke, this entire system peaks out at about 960 feet per minute. That's not, you know, in miles per hour, it's not a lot. It's about 11 miles per hour. But we're still, we're accelerating from zero to 960 feet per minute. 600 times a minute because we got to go 0, 960 to 0, and then on the return stroke, 0, 960 to 0. So if we have kinetic energy of 0 at, at the ends and we have some kinetic energy that's high peaking in the middle of the stroke, where does all that energy go? Well, that energy goes in and out of the flywheel. So our 300 RPM is not constant from the admission of power to the, uh, to, the, to the piston system, regardless of whether it's steam or internal combustion. But because you have a reciprocating mass that comes to rest at either we got zero kinetic energy, zero kinetic energy, and a peak, we have energy in the form of a sine wave, the kinetic energy at zero and at a peak, this energy has to go in and out of the flywheel. So the flywheel motion, let's say zero 
um, 90, 180, 270, and 360/ 0. The energy in the flywheel is going to be at a maximum when the piston is not moving. It's going to be at a minimum when the piston is moving at its fastest. At 180, pistons at the other end, the energy of the flywheel is going to be at a maximum. Minimum at 270. Maximum at 360. So that RPM of that flywheel is doing this. And this fluctuation in speed is superimposed on top of the one um, that is just the friction of the coast down and the admission of power at either end of the stroke. So a lot of complex things going on with the flywheel. That's why the flywheels on such things as hit and miss engines and big old single cylinder steam engines are so massive because the power strokes come relatively infrequently and you have to carry all of this motion at a relatively smooth velocity to do, you know, transmit your power either to a dynamo or to your driven equipment. Multi-cylinder engines have multiple power strokes throughout, you know, every, every 360 degrees of rotation. So their flywheels have come smaller and smaller and smaller. It's really a more efficient way of uh, building a prime mover is to have multi-cylinders and, and less mass in the flywheel, but um, you know it, it's just kind of cool because the old single cylinder engines with their massive flywheels, they're so neat to watch, and they just last absolutely forever because they're usually fairly slow speed, but hope you enjoyed this. It's just a quick technical analysis of what's going on with the flywheel without a lot of math involved, but this way you can visualize what's happening uh, in this kind of system. So that's all for Engineer's Workshop this time. I will uh, get back on the next phase of uh, discussion for the steam engine and uh, got some equipment coming. I keep telling you that, but uh, soon we're going to have something really exciting coming uh, to the shop. So thank you very much for all the new subscribers. Uh, share, like, and subscribe if you haven't already. And catch you next time on Engineering Workshop.